good morning to one and all a very warm welcome to today's webinar it's a special webinar this webinar will be given by none other than president of our society professor tg sitaram his webinar is on very important topic engineering preparedness and earthquake disaster mitigation uh, this topic of today's webinar is uh, perfectly gelling with our earlier webinars on um, ground response analysis seismic hazard assessment seismic microzonation there we have learned about uh, how to assess local site effects seismic hazard at a particular site as well as at city level now we will be knowing about how we can use this knowledge of earthquake engineering in mitigating earthquake disasters uh before uh, we start uh, um, the webinar we would like to make a couple of important announcements uh, one is regarding the certificates uh, for the past uh, webinar we have already issued the certificates uh, following the same procedure certificates for this webinar will also be issued for only those who give their attendance okay uh, sorry for this inconvenience we don't want to uh, our students to misuse these certificates that is the reason so my sincere apologies to all the seniors okay uh, not only certificates even feedbacks forms also will be sent to only those who give attendance and this attendance sheet google form will be circulated immediately after the lecture and also after the question answers uh, during the webinar we request all the participants to mute their mic and uh, we also request them not to annotate anything on the screen uh, now i request professor vasant to introduce our today's uh, speaker professor tg sitaram okay hey, thank you professor jakka uh, good morning to uh, one and all Uh, before i introduce today's eminent speaker professor tj sitaram i would request the host to start recording as well as i request professor sitaram to disable the annotation please so today's speaker is uh, as uh, professor jakka has said he is the president of uh, indian society of earthquake technology uh, he is currently the director of indian institute of technology guwahati and he had been uh, serving in the indian Institute of uh, Sciences in Bangalore as a KSIID teacher professor in the area of energy and mechanical sciences. Uh, he has been uh, also serving as president of the International Association for Coastal Reservoir Research. He is fellow of number of uh, organizations and institutions. He is fellow of the uh, ASCE Institution of Engineers in uh, Civil Engineers in UK. Uh, he is the diploma in geotechnical engineering dge of geo institute asce he is fellow of igs iset iscs and institution of engineers india he is a professional engineer that is pre engineer uh, and chartered engineer uh, india he is chairman of research council csir central building research institute cvr in roorkee uh, he has been uh, honorary professor professorial fellow at the university of wollongong in australia and distinguished professor at hong kong university international innovation center in china he has obtained his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the university of mysore and subsequently master's degree in civil engineering from iisc bangalore he he completed his uh, doctoral research uh, from the university of waterloo in canada and then he uh, spent some time in usa as a postdoctoral uh, fellow in the university of texas at austin Uh, he has been a, te a great teacher and a pioneering researcher he has guided more than 31 phd students so far 30 master student and large number of post doctoral students he had been associated with three startup companies at isc he has executed uh, more than 150 consulting projects and has five patents more than 500 publications 12 books to his credits currently his h index uh, is uh, 12 and itn index is 107 in google scholar he is a chief editor of international journal of geotechnical uh, earthquake engineering and editor in chief of uh, springer transaction in civil and environmental engineering 
So today we are fortunate to have Professor T. G. Sitaram to deliver his uh, ISET webinar on engineering preparedness for earthquake disaster mitigation. Professor T. G. Sitaram, please. Thank you, Professor Vasant Matsagar. Thank you, Sri Valsa and uh, Ravi Jakka for coordinating this ISET webinar series. I, I, I just request all the you know speaker, uh, all the participants not to request for remote control of your screen. It is popping up every moment on my screen. Please, uh, you know, uh, don't request for remote control of my screen. Anyway, it will not be given to you. <laughs> so please, uh, you know, refrain doing that. I think I'm seeing one, one uh, girl doing this. Continuously, it is popping up on the screen. So thank you very much. I think this is a great uh, webinar series and I have titled my talk as Engineering Preparedness for Earthquake Disaster Mitigation and Towards the Disaster Resilient Society. As you all know, earthquakes are one of the identified as one of the natural disasters. And uh, we as a country, I mean India, yeah. As a country, signed the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, uh, which is actually signed in 2015 and is uh, coming to an end at 2030. Okay, it's almost similar to you know, uh, sustainable development goals. Here also, the Sendai framework is a continuation of the previous framework uh, of disaster risk reduction. Sendai framework was the first major agreement of the post uh, 2015 development agenda and uh, provides uh, member states, that means all the countries, with uh, concrete action to protect development gains from the risk of disaster. There are basically, you can see, seven uh, global targets to be achieved by 2030. We're not very far away from that. We were only left with 10 years. There, the ideal is uh, reduce the global uh, disaster mortality, and uh, reduce the number of affected people globally, reduce direct economic loss in relation to GDP, reduce disaster damage to critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services. However, increase the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. Mm -hmm. This is the world global objective. Okay? Substantially enhance international cooperation, particularly uh, into also the developing countries. And... Uh, also, my, something is problem with the screen. Increase the availability of uh, screen control. Somebody has taken over. You see, that Shreya is taken the screen control. I think I have to stop the share and then come back. Hello, Ravi? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think someone is uh, controlling the screen. I, I will actually, I will... Disable. Shrey, yeah, I have disabled that. So, yeah, actually, even uh, you can remove her from the uh, participant. Yeah, I have done that. I have done. There was num one name with Shreya. I have done that. It was... Yeah. Because I keep on telling, but still uh, yes, yes. not. Yes, yes. So are you able to see this screen, my first screen? Hello? Now not the first screen. There Second is one? a screen with uh, uh, some uh, letters typed only. No, no, I have uh, removed that. You see. Oh, maybe, then maybe then you can uh, stop sharing and reshare, sir. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, now it's coming. 
professor is sharing the screen yeah now it's coming yes yes now maybe you can go to full screen mode and starts i have done it already i think it's yeah. Uh, yeah it takes yes yes the substantial actually the idea is substantial reduction of disaster risk and losses in lives livelihoods and health and in the economic physical social culture and environmental aspects of persons businesses communities in the countries so this sunday uh, framework is uh, only left with 10 more years so we have a lot of actually work to be done so i will actually begin my talk uh, you know uh, saying that that our planet is restless we can never control its activities inside and cannot control its vibrations so you could see that uh, major uh, plate tectonics major plates in the world that is the pacific plate south american plate african plate you can see the major seven plates and also this picture shows the active volcanoes plate tectonics and also the ring of fire i would like you to see the uh, you know the india where in uh, you know uh, there is a major uh, plate boundary between the eurasian plate and the indo australian plate and india actually the entire indo australian plate is moving at a rate of 45 mm for every year and that's why it's creating a, a plate boundary between the, the, the between the eurasian plate and the indian plate sir, so are, in, sir excuse me sir sir we are, we are very sorry to disturb you uh, actually uh, it is in, we are seeing only the first slide sir now is some problem then ah, no actually sir yeah. there is some problem yes sir this is my third slide okay now now we are able to see okay okay it's maybe slow the network is slow maybe i will change my network okay sir something else there is no problem we can resume after 5 minutes also you can take care of sir now it is perfect now yeah. it's showing no no but uh, i think net is also slow we are not able uh -huh. to uh sars animation video okay sir. yes 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 i think net is slow if sar can change i think it would be better yes sir you are able to see now yes sir we are seeing the third slide okay in present active volcanoes and plate plate tectonics right uh -huh. yeah it, it is in the slide mode if you can make it in the full screen mode presentation mode no, i have made it i have made it in the full screen mode it may be taking some time <laughs> yeah yeah I, now it's it has come sir if you want to okay. start maybe you can start it fresh also it is up to you sir no 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 yeah please please go ahead sir yeah. see i would like to actually also list the major historic earthquakes in the world if you look at the uh, for the indian plate and majority of our uh, large earthquakes happened in the northern and northeastern part of india and particularly 1897 assam earthquake which occurred on june 12th of 1897 uh, with a magnitude of 8 mw scale on the northern northern edge of shillong plate in meghalaya So in Shillong, they have put damage every stone house and half the houses built of wood. And then second major earthquake in India is the Assam again. You can see August fifteenth of nineteen fifty. This is uh, what we call as the Assam Tibet earthquake. So nineteen fifty with eight point six MW scale uh, in uh, Mishni Hills, almost on the other side of. Uh, Assam, uh, 1950 earthquake was the tenth largest earthquake in the 20th century. And what we could see here, here is the basically uh, how this earthquake has caused the, uh, almost the death of about 4,800 people at that time. See, please remember, during those days, 1950s, not much of population in the northeast, particularly in the uh, uh, complete northeast to the border of China. You could see the other major. Earthquakes of Chile, Alaska, China, Mexico City, but you could see very large population. I mean, large people have been killed 
by this earthquake of China in 1976, almost 7 lakh people. And similarly, even though the magnitude of earthquake was only 6.9 in MW scale of the Gujarat Buj earthquake, what we call as the Republic uh, Day earthquake, 2001, which also killed about uh, 1 lakh people. And then later in 2004, Sumatra earthquake. So like, like these, these major historic earthquakes, and you can, you can, I have just also shown you the five major earthquakes in India, which has killed large number of people. That is 1934, Bihar earthquake, on 8.1, 10,500 people dead. 1993, Maharashtra, which is called as Latur earthquake. So look at the magnitude of uh, scale, scale and the richness scale. There's only 6.4, but more than 15,000 people were killed. 1950, Assam earthquake again, which is uh, 1,500. And 1991, Uttar Kashi, which is only a magnitude of 6.1, but almost 3,000 people were there. Location and year and number of fatalities on the map of India is shown in the picture on the right side. So what, what we can clearly see is these earthquakes, which happens in a very remote area where population is less, the damage is also visibly less. So, I will also show you how these earthquakes will have a different uh, effects. First of all is the effect of ground shaking. The first main earthquake hazard is the effect of ground shaking, where buildings can be damaged by shaking itself. It's, it's about ground effect, where you can see the buildings uh, vibrate and uh, reaches the resonance, and then they collapse. Similarly, you can see the 1897 Shillong, some pictures. Andhra, 1905, 1934, Bihar, Nepal, and 2005, Kashmir earthquakes. So in all these, you know, many of these earthquakes actually influence of local geotechnical, geological, and topographical conditions are also affecting the, uh, the, the impact and the hazard. The amplitude and duration of ground shaking, which you all uh, learned in the previous uh, seminars, by many, many of the speakers, actually, many of the speakers you have heard speaking about geotechnical aspects, uh, including the, the recent one is the seismic microdonation by Professor Ghosh, and earlier even Vasant Matsagar also talked about the site effects, many, many others. So what is important is, you know, until very recently, up to 2000, we were actually not giving so much importance of geotechnical aspects. We were only looking at, actually, if you look at the research, also, most of us focused on the buildings and uh, how to make earthquake resistant buildings. That was the knowledge up to almost 2000. We have really done a lot of work actually after 2000 on the how these waves actually transmit and reach the structure. So, because these waves actually are created due to an earthquake, will transmit uh, uh, from the source and takes a path and uh, reaches the particular building. The scale at which it reaches uh, laterally is quite large. Several kilometers or several hundreds of kilometers also it can move. But however, in the vertical direction, when, when it comes closer to the building, in the top 100 meters, there are a lot of things happening. That uh, if there is a loose soil, the amplitude and duration of ground shaking, a specific site depends on energy release of the earthquake event, directivity of energy release, distance from the site to the earthquake source, geological conditions, and local soil conditions and topographical conditions. All of these actually amplify and changes the characteristic of the earthquake motion. So you can actually see what is exactly local side effect. If you see the motion uh, on the top of the rock, bedrock, below, the build, below a particular site. So how this sediment, you know, maybe, maybe a, uh, 10 to about 100 meters, sir. that's all. But those, how they modify the incoming wave field. See, if you look at, at this position, the you know the sediment, this is the earthquake motion, and it will be modified and amplified, okay, where both the amplitude will change. See, the amplitude was this much, and this is changed, and then frequency is changed, and the duration of the earthquake also is changed. These are all due to the soil characteristics, that is the sediment characteristics, and also sometimes it is also topographical effect. So these wave amplification in sediment layer is the key issue when you wanted to tackle the geotechnical aspects. And that is where you need to evaluate the hazard at the ground level where it is transferred to the building. So the wave amplification due to local topography is also very critical. You can see how if it is only on the sediment and if it is on a valley type of sediments, 
and on the crust of the slope in every case the, the typical configuration of the side effects needs to be captured it's very difficult actually both for the geotechnologists and also seismologists to really evaluate how these amplification and change in characteristic of the earthquake motion which reaches the particular site uh, for a particular building or a particular structure is okay. studies on the influence of the soil condition on the strong motion is not very very old it's only since the uh, Goro earthquake of 1985 in mexico city and then uh, Lanakan, Armenia earthquake, and then Loma Prita is the classical one, and San Francisco area, the Kobe earthquake, and then Kokeli earthquake in Turkey. These are the ones which actually started giving us some understanding of the soil effects on the earthquake motion. So historical references to the local site effects extend back, even though almost 200 years, but codes did not even take up even until 1970s and then re very re recently also I will talk about even now in some of the course uh, this, this aspect is not captured extensively. So damages due to local side effects and liquefaction is very common in any of the earthquake you take and everywhere you know the effect of subsoil on the earthquake shaking and building damage is actually very emphasized and very very important to be considered. But however most of our codes doesn't take into consideration yet. So in these cases, what we have learned from the, both the data of earthquake, uh, the deaths which happened in the large earthquakes, as well as uh, in the, uh, the, the way in which hazard is calculated, what we found is earthquake doesn't kill people actually, the buildings do. So I will just give you an example of Iceland. See, Iceland has a population of only 300,000 people. In very early days, it was only 50,000. A lot of people have moved, which is an area of almost 103,000 square kilometers. So, but uh, if you look at the earthquakes in Iceland, almost every day there will be earthquakes of magnitude of two and above. Okay, and uh, what is the recent uh, thing is that the earthquake is going to tear apart the entire the Iceland. But still, we are not really concerned about it because it is not large number of population or habitat is there, so there is no the effect. Even though the hazard is high from earthquake, but the risk is very, very low. So that's what I'm going to talk about. See, what we have to look at is, particularly the urban areas are the key. So many deaths and injuries in earthquake result from the collapse of structures, the way the population density is very high. So the solution, actually, whatever we are trying to look at, should not be looking at the solution in the earthquakes itself. That is either the prediction or anything, but it lies in the buildings. So we have understood reasonably well how to really build uh, the, the structures for earthquake resistant. So the solution actually not die, lies in the earthquakes, is only in building. So how one, one can actually minimize the risks and at the end, what really matters would not be the emergency response after so many lives were taken, but how to secure the lives and properties from this are. That's what basically my talk is going to be highlighting on how do we really prepare a country or a society to really to be prepared for an eventual earthquake hazard and in particularly in the very densest part of the country where large number of people live and large uh, structures have been built. So let me give you one example how this is very relevant population density is very relevant. See, if you look at, if you remember 1993 Lothu, the earthquake struck India at about 3.56 a.m. local time in the morning on 30th September of 1993. Actually, 52 villages were demolished in the interplate earthquake. It is measured about 6.2 on the moment magnitude scale. And approximately 10,000 people died while another 30,000 were injured. Why this such a huge one? Because people were sleeping very in unsafe houses. They actually, if you look at the structures, there are huge walls and which fell on the people when it vibrated. But the similar time, almost similar time, the next year itself, 1994, Northridge earthquake took place with a moment magnitude of much higher, 6.7. And blind thrust earthquake that occurred on January 17th of 1994, which also happened early in the morning, 4.30 uh, a.m. in the San Fernando Valley region of the country of Los Angeles. So on this day, 1994 earthquake rocks Los Angeles, California, killing almost 54 people 
and cause a billions of dollars in damages. So I will talk about death and the damages. Look at even this earthquake was also catastrophe, but the deaths were 54 because most of the people were sleeping in their safe houses. So then why a lot of damages? See, this was a long period earthquake. Most of the bridges were actually collapsed. If it had happened in the morning of 8 a.m. in the morning, I will tell you, most of the people who are going to office will get stuck on those infrastructure and would have been killed. Large would amount of deaths would have happened. Luckily, it was in the morning where American uh, people, citizens were living in the safe houses. So it's very important to understand how the buildings and the habitat plays a major role in the risk and, and uh, aspect. But I know, uh, because we are now, we are all actually facing uh, lockdowns due to virus attack. But what an interesting uh, virus related thing to the earthquakes. An unusual, an unusual effect of the North Ridge earthquake was an outbreak of a valley fever in Ventura country, which is basically a respiratory disease, very similar to COVID type of thing, where it was because of inhaling airborne spores of the fungus. So this is a very interesting observation. Many people were affected that time also in 1993, 94 earthquake. So this is just, I, I, I told you, because we are all now really worried about COVID-19 and many of you already maybe sick and uh, of uh, all these lockdowns. So uh, I, I thought, you know, we should see some of these also can happen due to the earthquakes. So to handle this, what, what are the solutions for us? What do what kind of fun is to take care of buildings? I think in structural design, I, and there is not much of thing left because we have a fantastic software where it can be done and uh, design uh, the concern structure and as an example, and also uh, in many of the other parts of the world also, we have built large amount of, uh, I mean, large structures, which can withstand even large magnitude of earthquakes. So the other one is to look at where the ground can be engineered. We can actually look at, there are fantastic ground improvement technologies where we could improve the ground to engineer and transmit less vibrations to the structures. And the structures should be designed to withstand these vibrations. So that's where the geotechnical you know, engineer's role will come into earthquake resistant design. So earthquake, tsunami, volcanic eruption, or any other phenomena that are, that are categorized as disaster are basically not hazard, disasters. They are hazards. I need you to, I think all of the speakers need to understand the difference between a disaster and a hazard. Disaster is always associated with the habitat and hazard is the one which is with the, the concern. And there also, I have also indicated already, hazard is also related with the, uh, the habitat. Why? Because if the same hazard of the same magnitude happens, in Iceland, it is no consequence for us. So if a major earthquake shook in an inhabited island, there were no fatalities, no building collapses, no public service disrupted, or in other words, the impact of the hazard is not disastrous. Then the earthquake is not very likely to be considered as a disaster. The efforts of every engineer, okay, it should be to mitigate and prevent the disaster and to reduce the risk. So there are two possibilities. One is the structural, Another one is geotechnical, where the ground can be improved so that the engineered ground will transmit less vibration to the structures and structures should be designed to withstand the vibrations. But now we also talk about what really is all transpired, this human response to earthquakes. See, let's look at it, you know, how much we people remember these earthquakes and how long. So then we can think about what could be the another kind of a solution. See, about uh, when an earthquake happens in the stage one, about within a, one, a minute, one minute, you know, after a major earthquake, the panic is created. And you could see it's almost like people can jumping, jumping out of the buildings and many, many things will happen. So about one minute to one week, there will be some aftershocks. Then also there will be a rescue and survival. There is a fear among the community about the earthquake. About one week to one month of a major earthquake, diminishing aftershocks, and short-term repairs will start by the people of their buildings 
and allocation and blame to builders and designers, officials, everything will happen. And the government also wakes up suddenly and say, okay, we need to repair these structures. About one month to one year, long-term repairs and action for higher standards. So we'll think about, okay, we need to revise our codes and all these discussions will happen. But after one year, there is a diminishing interest of one to 10 years. So after 10 years to the next step, we're relaxed into meet costs of the system provisions and increasing non-compliance. So this cycle is completely repeated because of the human uh, you know, memory. So the memory is very, very short for uh, the human beings. So forget all this disaster and uh, the damages, what they went through within a very short time. And then again, go back to the name, same normal mode where we don't do anything. So I think, you know, that's not a very good idea. So we need to actually prepare the community and this, we have to keep reminding the community that there will be a possibility of, you know, um, earthquakes. So we have to, the third aspect, one is the structural, second is geotechnical, the third aspect is preparation of the community. So these are the three, you know, major uh, steps which one can actually look at it. So I, I will just show you the, this is the 31st of May of 2020. That means today we are on June 3rd. Okay, this is 31st of May. Delhi, low intensity tremors, you might have heard several uh, low intensity tremors have occurred in Delhi. And uh, there's, uh, I mean, ma major geologists are saying major earthquake would hit national capital. Why this scale? You know, this is what we need to understand. So this is basically uh, in the last one, one and a half months, there are many, many my smaller earthquakes. Uh, they indicate a powerful uh, earthquake is going to come. That's what some of the geologists, whether, I'm not going to talk about whether it's right or wrong, but what is worry is if such a magnitude of earthquake occurs in the India's national capital, are we ready? Are we ready? That's the question I'm going to ask you. Are we ready? Can we, even if we are able to predict this by a minute or two minutes, what is that we could achieve? So have we really prepared our community to face such a disaster? That's the question we need to ask, ladies and gentlemen. So what, what I'm going to say is, we cannot really prevent earthquakes, but we can minimize the damage if we prepare the community. This is the third message I would like to say, not only just the ground improvement, the restoration, because for a country like ours, restoring, restoration, and retrofitting of buildings is a costly effect. Only people who have money can do it, but it's very difficult. Even government is unable to do, even the hospitals and such important infrastructure, but forget about restoring entire, uh, all the infrastructure, including the buildings. So what we need to do is we need to prepare because we care for the people. People's lives are important. I think COVID-19 has taught us, taught us that very well. And we have started realizing what is life is all about because these lockdowns actually have taught us a lot of lessons. Okay, and we need to sensitize. Sensitizing is the key for uh, preparing the community. Common arguments against preparing for disasters is it will harm the economy, people will panic, community is too poor to prepare for earthquakes. There are too many other high priority problems in the community. But all these are actually ridiculous because our COVID-19 has told us, see, if you heard uh, Bush, the Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. No. Yes, yes, yes. I think for a minute, you know, it was uh, I lost. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, now it's okay. Yeah, so, yes, yes. So the resilient uh, community for earthquake preparedness. Oh, resilient uh, to really to make a resilient community for earthquake preparedness, we need to understand the hazard locally, create awareness, organize community awareness events, review the plan and improve efforts, keep preparedness alive for long term, 
see this is very important you need to keep the preparedness alive for long term so that means you need to cover from school children to the old people that any place an earthquake can happen and what they should do before during and after earthquake it's very very key important i think you know we have to learn these lesson from japan whether an earthquake happens or not a drill is going to happen every year religiously like a festival like a deepavali or diwali festival you know we have to do, do an earthquake drill so and also we need to evaluate earthquake readiness index of, of through an index we have actually myself and shrivan sir has done this to see how much ready a community is we can also develop so this can be done through community meetings workshops emergency planning emergency planning for hospitals community earthquake drills school evacuation drills formation of student safety clubs neighborhood preparedness teams rallies or marches for preparedness displays a program so many innovative programs we have to keep doing it so that we can make street plays okay discussion talks by earthquake survivors all these have to be done see it is as important as restoration so let me tell you before an earthquake so we can look at you know the restoration and we need to prepare the people what they should do during an earthquake before and after earthquake what they should do that's very key and we need to train every citizen and i think that is a daunting task for the entire country so 1.3 billion people so they should know clearly what really happens uh, and what they should be doing in an emergency because they will have very little time so the life of the people is very important so they whether to do where where they should hide so they should not get panic that is what we need to teach them and maintain calmness and do things and also how the home owners can do there are so many guidelines you know i am not going to go and read all these things what they should do what they should not be doing and anyway i will share this presentation you can read it what i'm trying to say is how home owners also to prepare the plan every home owners they should be safeguarding this is structural so one is physical another one is the structural so in the structural also some of those geo technical aspects also will come in so what a country can do in this kind of a disaster and uh, that's very important so estimating risk of an earthquake disaster as all of you know and i have been told by many speakers seismic risk is not just depends on hazard it is the exposure vulnerability and the location so what i'm talking about exposure is the basically the structures the object built by the uh, mankind and the vulnerability is the damageability of the exposure under the action of the hazard and the location so in all these if we look at it the hazard also plays a major role so in here evaluating the hazard our role of geotechnical engineering is the most critical because the waves will actually pass through the soil as i showed you earlier so we need to consider how many code actually considers this to so that means if you want your structure to be perfectly fine then we should know exactly what is the uh, the the hazard we need to calculate this hazard and micro zonation as professor um, um, gosh has explained to you in the previous uh, lectures i will not go into details about but i will tell you is one of the important methodology for a nation to do this because this cannot be done by individuals this has to be done by the country the scientific institutions in the country should play a major role in evaluating hazard at a very local scale micro zonation is basically defined as a zonation with respect to the ground motion characteristics taking into account the source and site condition so why do we need this zonation see you are, the, the right side picture is a very well known picture for all of you which most of the civil engineers would understand the different zonation this is the national macro zonation what we call and it helps to identify the vulnerable regions see if you see the zone 2 okay zone 2 zone 3 zone 4 and zone 5 zone 5 is the one is the most critical which is north northeast and only the area is the buch buch area is being shown so it helps to identify the most vulnerable regions you can very clearly see that's the most vulnerable region provide necessary inputs for the earthquake resistant design but i will tell you the earthquake resistant design part i think most of our civil engineers are trained reasonably well they you, once you know what is the hazard what is the magnitude of the acceleration at the base one can design the structure structural design is not a very great great thing 
So reliable estimates of seismic hazard is the key for, for a country to provide to the citizens. So this is basically to minimize the loss of life, property damage, and social economical disruption. See, it is not just the design alone will help you, but it also gives you a lot of other uh, information. One, for example, the, for a land use planning, this will also throw a, a good idea where to really put uh, hospitals, where to put very important structures or nuclear structures or something like that. It's a, it gives you our way to put our schools and important buildings. So, and also it also provides an improved building design and construction because once you have a reliable estimate of hazard, we can do a design much more elegantly and efficiently. And also it gives you emergency response preparedness plan. For example, in the event, uh, there is an event, then you know, you know where to really send your the rescue team. Instead of sending randomly, you can actually focus it on the uh, area where the hazard is high. Economic forecast also can be done. Housing and employment decisions can be done using this and risk mitigation plan. Who are the users of this uh, microzonation or microzonation? The national, state, and local governments, decision makers, engineers, planners, and emergency response organizations, builders, and universities, and general public. So, spending on seismic microzonation or microzonation is a very, very important aspect. So, we need to do very elegantly and uh, efficiently and prepare good hazard map with reliable estimates of hazard. So that's where the microdonation plays a major role. And uh, myself uh, started getting involved in this from almost uh, 2000. We did a first, actually, some of you are aware of it. Uh, we have done the microdonation of Bangalore City. Even though that was not really a very earthquake prone area at that time, and even now. But we took it up because we were actually located in Bangalore and there was a soil effect. So we wanted to explain how the soils go to respond to the uh, seismic waves and we did a lot of work. And uh, here microzonation is the identification of separate areas having different potential for hazardous earthquake effects on the ground level. So level of study was carried out. The scale is also very important. I think Professor Ghosh has highlighted to you on the scale effects, you know, what scale we should do. Something like one is to 5,000 is the one what we are going to look at it to really to capture geotechnical information. But it's a very, very daunting task for a country like India. It's a very with different terrains and uh, different populations and economics and uh, hazard levels are also varying across the country. So whenever we do a scientific study on microzonation, we have to have consideration not only just the geological uh, information, also the habitat information. That means how many people are living. So even an earthquake of 6.2 can kill so many people in Latur is a clear example that, see, 6.2 magnitude of earthquake in Latur, where, you know, um, uh, it has killed more than 10,000 people. It's a clear example that when we evaluate the hazard, we also have to look at hazard in conjunction with the population density in that area. So, so the seismic hazard assessment and microzonation has really changed uh, in India uh, in the last 20 years. So quite a lot of work has happened where uh, I think uh, we should complement the Geological Survey of India to really map all the faults and uh, made it available for you on a digital platform on all the faults, lineaments, and uh, uh, shear zones and whatnot, and also we need to look at the maximum credible earthquakes, which are evaluated based on the near surface geology, considering type of soil and thickness of soil. And that's where basically the microzonation plays a major role. And g -Sharp is the first study, if you look at it in 1990s, you know, first study of the evaluating PGA from the probabilistic hazard analysis was done very, very recently in India. And still we do not have a code which talks about the probabilistic hazard analysis. Okay, so as I told you, the list of earthquake hazards can be anything from landslide, liquefaction, tsunami, induced effect, they're all actually uh, hazard. So when you are evaluating a risk, all many of these combinations have to be also be taken into consideration. I will talk about the little bit on the, the side effects, okay, from a quadral perspective. You see, if you look at the code, the Euro code 8, you know, there are actually two different uh, uh, the spectral amplification uh, versus period curves. 
or for type 1 where magnitude mw greater than 5.5 or type 2 magnitude mw less than 5.5 earthquakes for different soil conditions they have given you know you, you can see that you know the plateau and then how it uh, uh, reduces with the period so for different periods there will be a different uh, spectral amplification so what does code indian code consider is 1893 considers only three types of soils rock medium soil and soft soil even in the 2016 code this is the status so we need to really look at some of the soil effects uh, very carefully to evaluate the hazard and hazard evaluation is very very key important aspect in uh, this thing so i would like to just focus on uh, you know the is 1893 where the same actually been retained even now as from 2002 to 2016 So type one, type two, type three, wherein you know the hazard. Only the way in which acceleration is calculated has been changed now in the code. Okay, and uh, what is this is very very important that to understand what is the engineering bedrock, what is the seismic bedrock. That itself is not very clear for us yet. So an engineering bedrock is a bedrock where the uh, the shear wave velocity is something like seven hundred meter per second, and beyond that. It's a seismic bedrock, like almost 2,000, 2,400 meter per second shear waves. So whether from the seismic to engineering bedrock there will be amplification or not, still we haven't understood. There is a lot of scope for research in understanding the deep soil effects, uh, particularly when you go to the Indo-Gangetic belt of India, where you will not see a bedrock at all. See, it is almost three, three kilometers below. i uh, only you whatever you drill you will only see only the war burden and civilization so these are the issues some of the newer issues we need to take into consideration when you are looking at the side effects and uh, other aspects so the site classification based on uh, the international building code also uh, i mean uh, says very clearly there is a clear uh, distinction between the soft soil to hard rock and whenever there is a soft soil of 183 meter per second less than Uh, shear wave velocity how much shear wave velocity then you know we need to do much more site uh, investigation and do that when we did the microzonation of delhi like in cr region uh, actually the imd uh, of the group actually did that but we were myself with, along along with professor arya professor arya was the chairman of the review committee of that microzonation of delhi says microzonation of delhi in the region and i was also one of the member where the challenge was actually evaluation of the technical properties dynamic properties of soil so in, in in this region you know the evaluation of this is very very important and uh, i i actually have covered some of these aspects i will not spend much time on the earthquakes of these past you now we are just wake up whenever there is a major earthquake and revise our course and then our course right now uh, is this one after uh, 2016 there is not much difference between the what we had in 2002 and what i would like to say is how this seismic zonation map were developed uh, is 1962 based on only the earthquake epicenters 1962 we have brought in geology aspects and tectonic features 1970 after 1960 zone coil earthquake we, we started looking at the geotectonics in the 1984 past earthquakes and regional tectonics are also considered regional tectonics was considered and then 2002 you see after the 1993 lathur earthquake uh, we revised and, and even after 2001 bhuj earthquake 2000 seismic zonation map was uh, done with only four zones So this this is one of the four zones when came in into 2002, and then and I showed you already in 2016 what has been modified. So what basically uh, uh, the Bureau of Indian Standards of 1893 delineates different seismic zones entirely based on geology and past seismic activity, and is getting revised from time to time after major earthquakes. So Indian standard is in its current current form does not provide a quantified seismic hazard for each region, but lumps. Large part of the country into unstructured regions of equal size. This is uh, said by Engar and uh, uh, in his group in 2006. Clearly defines, you know, even up to 2016, we do not have a good a map, such as our map, which can really use. But there are a large number of maps were given by uh, many researchers in India. I'm not talking about that, but uh, adoption 
into ports is a one important where it could go into practice uh, wherein civil engineers start using that and the government also uh, uh, make it mandatory for when new buildings and new structures are constructed so a matter of this is a matter of grave concern that the use of current building codes devised on the basis of flawed national seismic zone map that are becoming a means to create unsafe buildings in large sections of the country uh, hence there is an urgency to produce scientifically correct national seismic zoning map this is told in kathri 2006 but still we didn't adopt this in 2016 we still went by lump mass maybe that is uh, because implementation is also another issue so the available state of the art knowledge base actually is large knowledge base is available now so we need to utilize that and a model to represent the earthquake occurrence process thus avoiding the bias caused by using the past earthquake only based on the zoning procedure so this has to be implemented in the code so that it is accessible to all the engineers in the country so we made some attempts in our work through our uh, you know we have also published ex extensively on the, the seismic zonation schemes for regions of different scales macro to micro to even at a city level so the even seismic urban seismic micro zonation of urban center was carried out by our group at ideas of science in bangalore uh, for city of bangalore and lucknow and we were also involved heavily in ncr region and also we were uh, evaluating many of the other micro donation uh, work which has happened in india so large amount of work and knowledge base which is available now and i think with the wisdom of all uh, people sitting together and bringing that into the codal practices is the key aspect and then implementation is the next step so so i'll just uh, take you through very quickly because many of you have already heard these lectures wherein uh, what uh, the procedure of micro donation and evaluation of hazard involves i will not get into the details and if some of you are interested you can go to one of my books on earthquake hazard assessment by sri wells and myself and look at it or if you are interested in micro donation then you can look at the uh, these are both in springer and crc press please go through that so wherein we talked about starting from you know uh, geophysicist job of data collection to homogenization and declustering and what is the beauty about today is all this data is available online to you all the earthquake data is available online to you so we need we, we have actually done the homogenization and declustering seismic source characterization and seismicity analysis and identification of attenuation relationship and hazard evaluation both by deterministic and probabilistic so this uh, large number of earthquakes events are considered for doing this and i will tell you we have done uh, extensively and uh, these books actually gives you the data for all this you can see from this also very clearly only the northern northeastern and andaman nicobar islands and little bit of bhuj uh, area the uh, or the which are affected otherwise the, the events are are also available in the uh, the indian uh, uh, peninsular india but however they they can only produce earthquake magnitude of 6 6.5 not but they are also very dangerous please remember and no area is devoid of any earthquake it means entire country we need to educate and prepare the community it is not really just uh, because as i told you earlier again remember that hazard is not the only one it is also the population density so our density is becoming very very large in every sector so we have to really educate people how to react for an eventual disaster from an earthquake so we in our work actually we divided the entire country into uh, four Uh, sorry five divisions wherein you know we can very clearly see based on the uh, seismic event distribution and spatial variation of seismicity parameters and fault alignment we have classified this into five regions and we can very clearly see that northeast is the number one and the north northern part of india these are the two areas are very very critical and even though the events are very large in number five please see the andaman nicobar because of population density is very very low so we are not given such much of an importance we have even pushed that beyond the major uh, the peninsular india this is what we would like to highlight to you so we when we do the analysis the hazard it is important to consider the population density and importance uh, should be given to that because the disaster is going to become a disaster when it is only hits the habitat so we have uh, some pictures showing i'm not going to the details of this but uh, the 
another important source is the identification of seismic sources. There are some hidden sources. Please remember some of these uh, maps which are not shown. For example, Latur one is one of that kind. See that earthquake actually was not on any uh, known fault. Then people, when we when they investigated, they found out that that was a hidden fault. So there are some of the hidden faults in the area. So don't be complacent. That's all I'm trying to say. See, no part of India people should be complacent that that they are not going to get an earthquake. So any place is possible to get an earthquake. So it's very important to prepare the community in this eventuality because some of these are unknown to you. When only when investigation is done at that scale, we'll come to know. So some of these, uh, you know, the, the, these are the data sheets of the SciSat, which are available to all of you today. They are all available online and digitally. Please uh, make use of it. Many of these uh, geotechnical or uh, the earthquake engineers would like to study on this. So that the, the digital seismic source map is also available with us. And if you are some of you are interested, we can also share that with you. That's not a problem. So we actually uh, initial days, I think uh, Srivall had created a website where you could download all these yourselves as well. So these are the, see, this is what I would like to show you, that these are the seismic sources. That means you please see which part of India is left out. So that means earthquakes can happen anywhere. But what kind of magnitude earthquake? What is the hazard level? And, and uh, that is associated with uh, population density. So many of the cities, even southern India, require some microzonation. See, when you look at Bangalore, it may be earthquake uh, magnitude may be lower, but the uh, population density is so high and the quality of construction is so low, so the disaster can be, uh, even for a magnitude of six earthquake, can be catastrophic. So that is what we're going to say, so that the entire India, we need to wake up and make a plan to prepare our community. Look at the events. Any area is not left out. Again, so they're all associated with uh, with some fault or the elements or anything. This is a very, you know, you could see the magnitude of eight to nine is only in the Northeast. And the seven to eight, somewhere in the North and Northeast only. Um, and also the Butch and Andaman and Ikubar. But the rest of the events, which are smaller magnitude events, and uh, this picture will tell you that we need to prepare the entire community in India. So uh, I will uh, skip some of these slides to, uh, for the sake of time, and because I'm almost covered one, one hour. So this, some of these details are actually already told by many speakers. That means it's very important to develop our own ground motion attenuation relationship, okay, uh, the regional level, because each one of them, our region actually reacts differently how the wave trans transmits uh, through the medium. And you can see some of the uh, recent uh, and widely recognized attenuation relationship of uh, developed by Indians, uh, Sharma and Professor, uh, many, many of them are comparable to, reasonably comparable to the one what is available from, for different uh, regions, I mean, in different parts of the world. So, and uh, hazard evaluation, again, there are two methods, deterministic and probabilistic, and where, again, how, how closely we do this hazard evaluation is also very key, and what is the scale. So, we have actually gone into very minor details of even categorizing the grid size of 11 kilometer by 11 kilometer, and uh, calculated the probabilistic hazard, as I told you. So, even though our code still doesn't follow the probabilistic hazard map, but we have developed the hazard map for the entire country. And it is available, not only we, many, many researchers have done it, and, uh, but we need to now sit together as a team and uh, put it into the codal practice and see that it has been practiced. So, uh, and these are all actually we have compared with uh, several existing data and existing maps and reasonably compares uh, uh, quality to the well, very well. And that, that's what the big, these pictures depict. It. So, and uh, some of the magnitudes, I've also put it up based on the zonal code. What it indicates is, if you look at the uh, the Bureau of Indian Standard Code of 2002, and what been estimated by several of the investigators, all of the assessment of hazard is much higher than what is listed in the code. That also tells us we need to really go back to basics and look at Okay, some of the hazards what we listed in our broad uh, seismic uh, macrozonation code, they were not correct actually. So, whether are these correct is a question one can ask. But what I'm trying to say is both are anyway theoretically evaluated ones. 
So we have to be scientifically, uh, uh, all the scientists should sit together and decide what should be adopted for the entire country. So we have also done some analysis uh, using uh, the existing softwares and so on. So what I would like to finally conclude is roadmap to seismic safety is the, the first importance I will give it to the community awareness and preparedness. And then we need to also make the legal framework so that whatever hazard values we have prepared, which will be adopted by the engineers and architects, the country, at least building and also the restoration plan from the government and probably and other agencies. And we need to also continuously engage our civil engineers to improve their competence, to understand what is happening and create a professional ambience. Maybe we need to bring the engineers bill uh, in the parliament so that, you know, if an engineer makes a mistake, he'll be also punished. So, uh, and uh, enforcement is the key, which is not really happening. Only we wake up when big major cross to big events happen and definitely research and development, which is happening in several countries. So some of those, so what I'm trying to say is that engineers, we have to look at even quantifying, measuring earthquakes to uh, evaluating the hazard to the construction, all aspects have to be considered. So we have actually looked at some of the borehole sensors, what you're seeing, some of you are not seeing. These are the borehole sensors you can actually put at different depths. And I'm seeing, you know, Tama there, who actually he did uh, supply this to us from Kinematics uh, at Industry of Science Bangalore. They have actually placed, and some of those uh, uh, kinematics equipments, uh, strong motion accelerometers are all still uh, located in IIC Bangalore on the hard rock uh, next to the swimming pool. And uh, we still record. And we have also given it to some of the other areas to create an awareness. So this is one in Mysore, this is the one at IIC. There are many broadband stations also we have maintained for a long time. And uh, Indian government has also put a large number of these kind of seismic stations across the northern part of India. They have a fantastic network. Soon, you will be hearing a talk from Ashok Kumar, Professor Ashok Kumar from IIT Roorkee, in uh, maybe in a month's time, uh, another webinar, where he is going to highlight how this instrumentation is going to help us in evaluating the hazard and what are the uh, problems and what are the issues and how we can really evaluate and validate the calculations, what all we have done in our... Uh, uh, so to conclude, so need for seismic hazard zonation maps, both at macro scale and micro scale, is very, very important and a lot of work has to happen. And most constructions in India are deficient. So we need to really educate our masons and there are a lot of efforts going on. I'm not uh, only talking about negative aspect of it, but India is a big country, but we need to accelerate this and make more masons to be ready to really do, do good construction, quality construction. And uh, solution actually lies in buildings and foundations and uh, really not in earthquakes as such. So a lot of money uh, which is uh, being spent on early warning predictions. It's also very important. I'm not de denying that, but we need to also put similar kind of large amount of money on preparedness, reaching out to the uh, community at every scale, you know, at every level, at every village, in every panchayat. So we should make them aware that earthquake can hit them. It is not that no area is isolated. So a start evaluation considering side effects is very key and a lot of research are happening. I'm very happy to say large number of papers into technical earthquake engineering are happening because we know we are organizing the, the, the seventh international congress on um, geotechnical earthquake engineering, which is supposed to be held in July of uh, 2020 in Bangalore. It's been postponed due to COVID-19 uh, to July of 2021. I would request, urge you or all of you to attend that. So I, before I go and show some of those details, I say we need urgent interventions and community preparedness. And it has to, there are fantastic documentation prepared by NDME and many other agencies. What we need to do is we need to make them practice at every level, schools and then uh, panchayats and villages. You know, every villager has to be made aware and also we need to build infrastructure, resilient infrastructure to take care of earthquake disaster. So I would like to just show you the seventh international conference has been postponed now to July 12th to 15th of 2021 which has been uh, organized by Indian Institute of Science and ISEC Roorkee, IIT Roorkee, as well as CBRI Roorkee. So please, you know, attend. 
and we have received large number of papers you know more than 75 to 25 keynote papers and another invited and so lectures almost to totaling to 75 invited talks and then more than 450 abstract we received and i will assure you that we are going to bring uh, all these papers as planned <clears throat> by the month of maybe not in july maybe i guess september we should have this uh, these are all papers been published by springer proceedings and all of them are getting ready actually we have handed over 175 papers already to springer and uh, we are soon will be handing over almost 25 keynote papers to the springer as well as a special book and there are some other 50 sub lectures and other and this conference will be held in the jain tata auditorium at indian of science i welcome all of you and participate in this conference in uh, july 2021 please mark your calendar so this is the team which we are working on this and i will also would like to gladly tell you indian society for earthquake technology is trying to bid for the 18th world conference on earthquake engineering in india so this 18th world conference that means after 48 years we are we had this world, uh, world conference in delhi in 1976 at that time even prime minister uh, madam indira gandhi was present and met every you know uh, delegate but similar you know environment we would like to create in 2024 we have already sent our interest to the international body iaee saying that india is interested there are five countries canada france india italy and new zealand has shown interest to bid for the 18th world conference in the church of kingly and uh, we have already requested the moes support us to bid this activity by november i think we will have we we'll clearly know this november 2020 that whether we are going to get the uh, the world conference of earthquake engineering that will be a great event for india because we are holding this after 48 years we have already received a very strong support from the government of india we have received a letter from the cabinet minister of science and technology dr ashok dengi and we have requested the ministry of science and secretary to also support us and give us his uh, uh, letter of support to us so that we can bid for the world conference on earthquake engineering 17th world conference on earthquake engineering is also postponed please remember it should have been in september of 2020 in uh, sendai that's also postponed to september of 2021 exact dates are not yet announced so again we all have to go there and popularize our conference in 2024 if we get we win the bidding uh, this. with this i would like to thank you very much thank you all if you have some questions i will take thank you thank you professor sitaram for the wonderful uh, talk so in fact i uh, yes sir can you hear me yes yeah we can hear yes yes Yes, yes, yes. So we had uh, around four, five hundred participants, which is the maximum capacity of this our Zoom platform, which we have subscribed. So from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of I said, and on my personal behalf, I express sincere thanks for Professor to Professor Sitaram for the wonderful talk. So we have around five hundred participants, and we have asked many questions also received privately and also publicly. so in the chat box maybe we will select maybe a couple of them because we have only half an hour time and maybe i will uh, repeat the question maybe you can answer sir so there is one question from shreyas he is asking what type of foundation we should yeah. construct to to prevent collapse of high rise building during major earthquake It's, a, it's an interesting question yeah. so you are talking yes, about yes. high rise buildings so if it is a tall structure if it is a tall structure of more than 20 floors or 25 floors generally they are founded on deep foundations okay so today the burj khalifa for example if you go and see the burj khalifa one of the tallest structure uh, going up to almost 850 meters tall above the ground has a foundation as what is called as pile rock foundation that means piles and these piles are only 50 meter long deep okay below the ground maximum pile depth is 50 meters for a height of 850 meter tall building please remember that okay and the raft is actually sitting on the ground so some portion of the load is transferred to the raft and some portion of the load is taken by the piles so how much 
something like you can say 70-30. 70% load is transferred to the piles, 30% load to the raft. Maybe the pile raft foundation would be a very good idea because it's a new, actually this is a new foundation, actually, new type of foundation. It is not practiced. Actually, always we used to keep the raft above the ground level. But now the raft is on the ground level and sitting on the ground, some of the load transferred through the raft. So this is a new way of uh, looking at it. I think this would be the very good idea of pile raft foundation for the tall structures. And that is what has been adopted for Burj Khalifa. And you could see Burj Khalifa, if you, some of you are gone, you have a uh, 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 the active uh, vibration control, uh, passive vibration control on the top of the structure as well. Yes. Before going to the next question, uh, there is a small announcement to the participants. The attendance sheet has been already circulated in the chat box. So you, the e-certificates will be issued based on the attendance you mark. So those who have not filled yet, I see that around more than 400 already filled. So those who are yet to fill the attendance, please mark your attendance uh, right away before ending the session, uh, before 12.30, please. So we will go to the next question. There is a question from AKG. He is asking which method is suitable for finding dynamic bearing capacity of soil. Dynamic bearing capacity. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you see, this is a very, very tricky word. Let me tell you. Why? Because first of all, the allowable bearing capacity, what we teach in foundation engineering is one. Dynamic bearing capacity, what modal provisions say, reduce it by 80%. 80% of the safe allowable bearing capacity is the dynamic bearing capacity. So the methodology, what we have is all, uh, you all know already either based on uh, the SPT, based on concentration test, or based on the bearing capacity equations, or some of them are also on plate load test and other uh, in-situ test methods. So anything, you know, uh, in geotechnical engineering, one technique is not good enough. There is nothing like a set of science of, okay, based on SPT is very good. You cannot say that. You have to have more than one method, particularly for important structure, to evaluate the bearing capacity. Even for small structure also, what we are doing is, if you go to any geotechnical report, you can see at least more than one method has been used. One is based on SPT, one based on conversion from SPT to SPT, and then one is based on bearing capacity equations. Even equations also, there are many. There are more than 10, 15 uh, constantly used equations, Hansen's method, and then uh, Torzegi's method. But what I found as a geotechnical presenter, Torzegi's method of evaluation bearing capacity, even today it is very well. Please remember that. Torzegi's evaluation of bearing capacity, even today it is valid, and you can adopt 80% reduction, that is 80% of that to, or to the evaluate the dynamic bearing capacity. Thank you. Yes. There is a question from Arsha Tyagi. Can we get some idea just before the earthquake is going to occur? on the basis of normal available resources or any other natural activities? A general question. Can, can we get some idea just before the on the basis of natural activities? Yeah, yeah that is actually, you know, uh, the, the, see, I actually like this. Not some vibrations. Based on that, there are many uh, predictions uh, people have uh, developed okay, to evaluate uh, uh, the even the shear wave velocity is also calculated. Even what uh, height we can go. So there is uh, this uh, the methodology. You can actually use that, but they are all uh, still had to be I mean, validated through some other indirect methods. That. But there are available methods. Yes. Thank you, sir. There is a question. Um, which method of estimation of earthquake force is better, deterministic or probabilistic? Again, this is a very interesting question. Okay. Um, for some structures, deterministic is better. For some kind of structures, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, probabilistic is better. See, for example, for uh, nuclear power structures and very large dams and other things, you know, probabilistic method of hazard analysis is much better uh, techniques. But if you know the source, exact source 
uh, of the that is the fault on which it's happening and uh, the deterministic case so there is a, actually a separate uh, uh, section in the i think i forgot the about the journal wherein you can see about which techniques are suitable for what kind of conditions so if some of you are interested you can send me an email i will send you the link of that particular volume of the journal of geology wherein they have talked about in what conditions probabilistic hazard is better in what condition the deterministic hazard is better thank you sir there is a question from others can we predict earthquakes yes and no i see definitely you know that some of these particularly i showed you the strong motion array what has been put to you including the borehole sensors what i showed you uh, people have done it uh, for example uh, japan uh, k2 band network and then uh, taiwan uh, they have put and even in india we have put in the northern part of uh, every district we have a strong motion from that array one can actually say you know uh, we can predict based on the p wave arrival early uh, we can predict but the prediction would be about maybe a minute or two minutes early about a minute a minute and a half or only that prediction is possible but uh, what you can do with that prediction is the question we need to ask as a user so this prediction of one one and a half minutes early so you can actually terminate most of the nuclear power stations and uh, which can cause the indirect induced effects of the earthquake if it closer to the uh, fault region near fault region so the earthquake prediction is a science which is uh, actually happening and uh, but uh, at the same time uh, it doesn't give you enough time for the mankind to really understand and do something uh, beyond that so beyond turning off some of the uh, uh, important uh, a uh, power uh, structure unit so that which can cause fire or which can cause uh, major damages uh, like that but otherwise the prediction is not yielded much okay uh, of the uh, that's what i was trying to tell you uh, so we should we should be spending more time on the community awareness than on the prediction but the, the people are actually scientists scientists will be doing because scientists would like to really take control of the situation saying that we can predict the it is very difficult topic difficult even if you predict what or what is that you are going to do that is the question i as an application engineer will ask okay so but the, i i hope all of you understood the importance of prediction and not uh, preparing the community. thank you sir there is a question ashtod jagtap some ancient structures are still standing even after so many disasters which is astonishing your experience on any such structures yeah this is a very fantastic question i really love to answer this is where my aspect of what i talked about ground improvement techniques most of the temples in india has a fantastic ground improvement below the structure which needs to be understood recorded historically done it but we haven't done it yet we do not know what materials they have used how they have really so there are some temples where they have used a very cushion type of material below the ground you know below the ground of fine nickel which has really given lot of uh, you know earthquake resistant is all for that so this part actually we are not even teaching in many of the courses so the, we we talk about uh, the ground improvements as a separate topic but we don't talk about how the earthquakes really uh, respond to the ground improvement techniques adopted so this is where i think we need to look at some of those newer materials also geo cell foundations and all these you know we have to look at it and uh, understand study there is a lot of scope and most of these uh, ancient structures which are withstood have a very unique way of preparing the foundation and ground before the foundation even is laid that's where i think we haven't done much work we need to do that and it's a very very important question and i'm very happy that it is coming from a i think is one of the student hope so hopefully hopefully yes thank you yes yes because we cannot identify yes yes thank you so there is a question from mohammed fasil he is asking 
as entire northeast india is under red zone is there any need for the government to restrict population in that area whether population control is necessary because entire northeast india falls under red zone so you are very very uh, rightly and aptly uh, asked the question but controlling population uh, in that area is very difficult because see people are now seeing a lot of developments but what we can what government can do is i will tell you they are also building large dams our power uh, and uh, uh, water holding dams large dams actually 300 large dams are being constructed in the north east i think that maybe government should think about uh, not doing that because those are all very ticking bombs because if a major earthquake event happens and they is going to damage them and which will uh, uh, catastrophic effect of the secondary effect of the earthquake earthquakes and again uh, the dam break and uh, the downstream people are all getting flooded so the earthquake and flood combination is going to be a very catastrophic in the northeast so i don't know whether we can control the population because uh, uh, it's a very difficult terrain anyway and non reachability particularly arunachal the meghalaya a very difficult terrain and very beautiful as well you know nowadays i am uh, there and traveling i'm saying is very very beautiful brahmaputra valley is amazing and uh, but uh, the danger is these large dams that's all i will say at this moment i think people are aware of it and uh, nothing much can be done and i don't know whether we can control the population or not that's a very difficult uh, task yes. for uh, any government to think about thank you sir there is a question from srinivasa what is the major critical input for microsonation of a city as i told you major critical input is uh, hazard at a small scale and uh, population density okay so with yes. combination of that only we need to decide otherwise simply you know evaluating the hazard and showing it is very high and we will do all the retrofitting is not a good idea it is hazard and the density of population because then you can see what could be the economic loss what could be the uh, loss to the people and then you know you can do the appropriate retrofitting or whatever measures we are going to take uh, that would be very ideal a question from avik kumar mandal in case of any occurrence of earthquake is it appropriate to stay inside the house or we should come out from the house under the sky away from the building how to decide the same during the occurrence of any earthquake is there any guidelines on this from ndmi or so please advise Uh, every every uh, every i mean uh, institute in the country has uh, uh, prepared guidelines how to really react to an earthquake but i will tell you as a very layman simple to you i shown you three pictures if you remember one table was there so don't try to run out of your building you don't have that kind of a time <laughs> okay there is nothing you can do because the time what we are talking about is 40 seconds to 1 minute and 30 seconds okay so better not come out of the building so take a shelter below a hard surface like a table dining table or a cot okay wherein you can hide below that so that you can avoid okay so don't run into elevators don't run to staircases because they are more vulnerable than these hard structures so the time available for you soon after you feel the earthquake so because first 10 seconds it is gone to even sense it and another one maybe a minute is left to you there is nothing much you can do better take a shelter in your own room wherever you are in your house below a cot below a hard surface like a table dining table or anything that would be the best thing thank you sir sir we have i think maybe more than 200 questions and we may not be able to all of them <laughs> i would like to know how much time uh, you can spend because our schedule no, no, 3 more minutes i think we should close it in 5 minutes like that because yes, you see yes, these yes. questions we can never uh, satisfy yes, everybody so yes, they yes, can yes, always yes. you know uh, because there are many speakers and many speakers have already spoken and many yes, others yes. are coming there are many many experts are coming to talk to you so i think they will clarify all those uh, details maybe yes, another 5 minutes i can spend some time and yeah sure sure answer to my understanding whatever i have so because as this is a general session there are questions from all aspects of earthquake engineering including preparedness and other structural geotechnical also there is a question from bm war 
he is asking what is the return period of large earthquakes in shillong region or northeast region what is the return period of large earthquakes in the northeast region yeah see this is a interesting uh, technical question <laughs> yes, yes so in a country of india return periods are uh, smaller in northeast okay so if you look at uh, large earthquake of 1950 after that we don't have any major earthquake happened uh, in the northeast so it, it may it may vary anywhere between 50 to 100 years is the for the large earthquakes of magnitude 8 and above there is a question from kishan which one of the best techniques for earthquake resistant building deep pile foundation or bearings put at foundation <laughs> it's again a very interesting uh, simple question so everywhere you cannot adopt uh, deep uh, pile foundation foundation design is a very very unique uh, you know is an art i will tell you geotechnical engineering itself is an art more than a science so uh, this question is now you cannot say this is good this is not good you know, sometimes even solid foundations are much better performs fantastically well when compared to deep foundations okay uh, there is a question from madhu can we calculate shear wave velocity using cpt values yes yes definitely and there are correlations and uh, there are some cones with uh, measuring of the velocity sensors also at the tip of the cone so uh, we even actually in our institute of science developed seismic vibrocone where in you know there will be a sensor at the tip of the cone itself so which we have developed indigenously also so there is a possibility and uh, there are uh, non destructive instead of going into the ground there are uh, like masw multi channel switch waves with different uh, configurations are available today so where you can measure the shear wave velocity uh, very accurately reasonably accurately uh, to a depth of 50 to uh, uh, 70 meters there is a question a similar question uh, like uh, one was posed before uh, sir which is the best way to evaluate seismic bearing capacity of shallow foundations from arjun <laughs> <laughs> seismic bearing capacity i told the bearing capacity itself is a uh, topic uh, is done uh, by very but there is nothing really evaluate seismic bearing capacity directly you can only do the bearing capacity and calculate reduced bearing capacity for seismic condition maybe we will take one last question there is a question from vami khan i want to know whether there were any conventional or traditional methods for for prevention of earthquake impact in old buildings he wants to know was any traditional or conventional method before Uh, for prevention of earthquake impact in old buildings yes 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 actually india as a civilized country i think india i i will tell you i am very passionately talk about india india is a country which is a very very knowledge society see they had such a fantastic technique somewhere we have forgotten on the way we were the you know if you see the 5000 years of history of india we were the one who told how to really build uh, cities and how to do the uh, sewerage system water supply system to every building you know harappa manjadaro has the farm stated that similarly if you go to assam you go to sikkim there are fantastic structures you know assam light roof structure is a fantastic one you know very simple very simple the walls are also simple with bamboo filled with earth and then the roof is also light structure so they knew that light structures are fantastic wooden wooden structures so we don't need to really go elsewhere in the world to see uh, we our community has actually somewhere you know in the process we forgot and started adopting all these concrete so civil engineering you know in a concrete is a one which has worked us worked for us very eloquently also but at the same time it also stopped understanding the other techniques which were there because we push slowly concrete has pushed all other materials away because it is so easy to really fabricate at wherever you want so 
I feel there are fantastic structures. If you go to uh, Sikkim uh, with an all-round structure to resistant, and even our recent code also talks about uh, vertical reinforcement in uh, uh, masonry, uh, horizontal reinforcement in masonry, corner reinforcement in masonry. All these are techniques which were actually used by our ancestors also in many of these structures. And as I told you, in many of the temples, the ground improvement below so that uh, you know, it lacks like a cushion, waves will not amplify. All that has been you know, done by the ancestral, I mean, we have to study and record them properly to understand. And there could be a fantastic learnings from there as well. Thank you, sir. So Thank I appreciate all the participants because there is a flooding of questions and uh, we could pick up only maybe 10 or 15. So sorry for because it is not possible to attend every question. And actually, there are so many comments, no, appreciate, uh, appreciating Professor Sitaram's presentation and so many comments. Uh, comments and questions also mixed up. So I might have missed uh, so many important questions. So sorry for that. Uh, whatever was just visible, we have picked some relevant questions. So we had around 500 participants from over 20 countries for this session. And this lecture by Professor Sitaram was planned earlier in the beginning of the uh, webinar series, but you know he is very busy being the director of IIT Guwahati and uh, we could get a time and date for today and we, uh, it is not good to keep him for long. So uh, we thank uh, Professor Sitaram for his time and for the wonderful presentation enlightening all of us and special thanks to all the participants for uh, attending this webinar and also for making a donation to PM cares for a noble cause. So maybe I will hand over to Dr. Jakkat for any remarks. Thank you, Dr. Srivalsa. You well said about uh, everything. And it is a really very thought provoking lecture. We are all very, very thankful to Professor T.G. Sitaram. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It is a really wrapping lecture to whatever we had so far. Like you covered all the aspects and uh, explained us how we can mitigate earthquake hazard. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. We all thankful to you and to the participants. Thank you. Thank you, one and all.